Good morning. Welcome uh, to our worship service. Let us all be glad and uh, come rejoicing as we enter into the house of the Lord. We will be celebrating Holy Communion today after the sermon. For those worshipping with us online, I ask that you prepare and get ready the elements for the Holy Communion, which can simply be juice and bread or biscuit. So let us now in silence prepare our hearts to worship God. A call to worship this morning is taken from Psalms 84, verses 1 to 4. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for making us, thank you for accepting us as your people. Thank you for your loving care to us. And as your people, we now come gladly to worship you, O Lord. We come before you singing joyful songs, acknowledging that you, O Lord, alone is God. We enter into your sanctuary with thanksgiving from our hearts. We desire to enter into your presence singing songs of praise to you. Because you, O Lord, always does good things for us always faithfully love us and never forsake us. Father God, come and receive our adoration. Come and rule over us as our Lord and King. Be pleased with our worship this morning. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Now invite the uh, worship team to come and lead us into a time of worshiping in spirit and in truth. Good morning, everyone. Even though we we're a few, we're two or more gathered in his name. There he's in the midst. So let us rise and let us sing and worship God this morning. <laughs> I worship you. I worship. 
worship you. I worship you. The reason I live is to worship you. joy of reaching your heart when my will becomes enthralled in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you I worship you I worship you To leave the God I love, here's, here's 
pierce my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts
Okay. Let us uh, get back to worship. Let us continue our worship with our tithes and offering. The protocol will remain unchanged. There will be no collection of offering. Instead, please put your offering in the envelope provided and drop it off into the little chapel offering box over there as you leave the sanctuary through the door over here. For those who are worshipping with us online, you can either drop off your check in the church mailbox and call the church office to collect it or you can mail it directly to the church address. Listen now to Malachi 3.10 as we present our offering to God. Bring the whole tie into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for promising us abundant provision in our life. And as we return a portion of what you have blessed us with, please accept our offering, our sacrifice of thanksgiving to the furtherance of your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I refer you to the church bulletin uh, for the announcement. First of all, a warmest welcome to all of you who are participating our in-person worship service and those who are worshiping with us online as well. Uh, in particular, I'd just like to welcome uh, my two old friends, okay, uh, visiting from Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, second item, uh, praise, praise God and, and, and thanks to your uh, generosity. We have received a total of $19,105 in a love offering for uh, Pastor Poon for his uh, retirement. Next, the church secretary will be on vacation from September 1st uh, to 12th. And uh, myself also, okay, together with uh, Julie, will be uh, on vacation from September 17th to October the 6th. The upcoming uh, baptism will be held on December 18. The deadline for registration is November the 20th. If you want to receive, if you want to be baptized, and if you have completed uh, the baptism class, uh, please contact uh, Pastor Feng uh, or one of the elders. The uh, Cantonese and the Mandarin Sunday service uh, speakers schedule for September to December has been posted on the church uh, bulletin board at the foyer. Uh, please uh, remember to pray uh, for the speaker. If you have any question, uh, feel free to contact the elder board. For our Bible reading uh, campaign, we are now on the book of Romans. Uh, we'll be ending uh, Romans 16 on this uh, coming Saturday. And then on, we will move on to the next book, which is uh, 1 Corinthians. Now, the update, uh, the update uh, and prayer item for Taiwan uh, Baojong Alliance Church is on the right-hand page of the bulletin. Uh, remember to uphold them. Uh, in your daily prayers. Right. And last of all, continue to pray for the search for our next uh, senior pastor and also for the youth and young adult co-worker. Most of us have been to a church retreat or camp where we were spiritually lifted up. We probably would have made a commitment or been challenged to rededicate ourselves to live the Christian life victoriously, 
or differently from before. And for his glory and for our own good spiritually. During the retreat, we did our daily devotional, listened to God's word being preached, and had a great time of close fellowship with church brothers and sisters. We feel extremely blessed and close to God during those days in the retreat. However, when we returned home to where we work or study, we could find ourselves not being able to continue our fervent Christian living and service. It is like having a dose in the retreat to keep us spiritually high for a while. But when the effects wear out, we return to our normal self. It will do us good to be mindful and careful about this. The concluding chapter 13 of Nehemiah is also a warning against spiritual carelessness. It reminds us how things can easily and gradually slip away without our notice. A healthy spiritual life in one year or at one particular moment hardly guarantees that it will always be so. Individuals change, and so can churches. If you like stories with happy endings, like I do, you will not like chapter 13 of Nehemiah. You will probably feel that the book of Nehemiah should have ended with the great celebration recorded in chapter 12 of the dedication of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And in a climax, in the first three verses of chapter 13, um, of their pledge of obedience to the word of God, now these verses, these verses, the first three verses, are indeed the ending of the book of Nehemiah in a climax high note. But when we read verses 4 to 9, and now move on to reading from verse 4 onwards. Now before this, that is before the first three verses, this thing happened. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels and the tithes of grain, wine and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers and gatekeepers and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. That is, Nehemiah is not, was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frank, frankincense. When we read these verses, we discover that before the high note in verses 1 to 3, it is really the story of a bad work slide on the part of the Jewish people while Nehemiah was gone for a while. As the old proverb used to say, when the cat's away, the mice will come out to play. The trouble actually began before the very day of the dedication of the wall, while Nehemiah was away. When Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, the flame of Israel's distinctive testimony was flicker, flickering uh, badly. If their lowering standards were allowed to continue to decline, 
Israel's unique spiritual influence would be diminished. God's people were meant to be a light for the Gentiles and destined to take God's salvation to the end of the earth. God's people ought to be careful spiritually. Today's sermon is entitled Spiritual Carelessness. In order not to allow our spiritual life to slowly slip away, we must stop compromising on what we know right. And we must stop tolerating what we know to be wrong. First, we must stop compromising on what we know right. The downfall of spiritual life often begins with compromising on what we know to be right. The first compromise was to allow the enemy to live in the temple, and that is for Nehemiah's case, right? As priests, Eliashib make an alliance with the ungodly and hostile do- Tobiah. From verse 38 of chapter 13, we know that Eliashib, the high priest, had intermarried with the family of Sanballat. Consequently, it will also make sense that he would want to accommodate Tobiah. So he prepared a large chamber for Tobiah to live in the temple. Next, the chamber that was used to house Tobiah was the once consecrated storeroom to store the offerings and the sacrifices of God's people. It is like inviting a stranger with whom you have doubt, you know, to stay in the room where your safe box is. Tobiah, living in the temple, violated the holiness of the temple and interrupted the sacrifices of the people. His living there not only desecrated the temple, it displaced the sacrifices intended for worship. The sad irony is that a priest who should know what was right was actually disrupting the sacrifices. This decision to accommodate Tobiah revealed the depth of the sin of the leaders. Compromising our obedience always impacts our worship. Now, we do not know how long Nehemiah was absent after his return to Persia or under what circumstances that led him to request permission from the king to return to Jerusalem. Perhaps he heard about the lingering problems of sin in the holy city. Or because of Nehemiah's absence, the sin of the people increases to a great extent. Eliashib's actions were not just errors in judgment. They were evil, according to verse 7. It was not enough simply to remove Tobiah from the temple. The area needed to be cleansed in order to be useful again for worship. Nehemiah also restored the rooms to their original purpose. Nehemiah's cleansing of the temple reminds us of one of Jesus' later work in cleansing the temple of his day. Jesus cleansed the temple of the money changers and sellers of merchandise because of his disgust at what they had made of God's house of prayer and his zeal to purify it from the abuse of ungodly men. We will do well to reflect upon what areas of our life that need to be cleansed. The second compromise was that the people had stopped giving their tithes and offerings to the Lord. Now, perhaps I'm touching on the nerves of some people here. I hope not. Okay. Let us continue reading from verse 10 through 14. 
I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did, work, who, who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their station. Then all Judah brought the tie of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses, Shalemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Pediah of the Levites, and as the assistant Hanan, the son of Zaku, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Now the last verse, verse 14, needs a little explanation here. Nehemiah is not being psychologically egoistic, asking God to remember him for his own self-interest but that he was concerned that God would remember him and not block out what he had done faithfully. In this passage, Nehemiah seems to be correcting an abuse of, the, of long-standing. Strictly speaking, the Levites had no income or possessions or assets. As prescribed by God, they were totally dependent on the support of the people through their faithful tithes and offering. However, in the present scenario, they had to return to the field to make a living for themselves and to feed their families because they were not receiving their rightful compens compensation. All this because the people had compromised in stopping to give their tithes and offering to God. Nehemiah blamed the rulers for this great negligence. So he made things right by appointing four reliable and trustworthy treasurers to be in charge of the temple's storeroom. One was a priest, one a Levite, one a scribe, and one a layman of rank. Their task was to distribute the necessary supplies in an equitable manner. But the truth is that all of us can commit the same mistake if we are not careful. Unfaithful giving and irresponsible management are definitely telltale signs of decline in our spiritual life. Let us heed Nehemiah's warning. Now the third compromise was that the people had ignored God's standard of purity of faith. Let us jump to read from verse 23 through 28. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of the children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. Now this is the humorous part, right? And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, you shall not give your daughters to the sons, or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his people, uh, sorry, by his God, and God made him king over Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, 
the high priest was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. The people, the people not only compromised on what was right to do in temple worship, but now on their now in, in their home and family life as well. Despite the measures that both Ezra and Nehemiah had taken to eradicate mixed marriages, it remained a persistent problem. The people had promised earlier to separate from their foreign wives. Now remember that the focus here is of purity of faith rather than racial superiority. First, the people had grieved God by marrying foreign wives to promote their commercial interests. Second, they had ignored the plain warning of Scripture. God had not only given them clear commands about mixed marriages, He had provided stark illustration in His Word about the dangers inherent in such compromising and forbidden partnership. Nehemiah threw the question at them, directing them to the story well known to all their people. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like Solomon, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women make even Solomon to sin. Third, the people were indifferent to the disastrous consequences of their sin. The mother's role in the family is crucial. Normally, she is the one who spends most time with her children. And naturally, they are going to adopt her principles, copy her lifestyle, and certainly follow her faith. Inevitably, they would speak her language. And so the likelihood of their, of their learning Hebrew was remote. Yet Hebrew was the language in which their scriptures were written. And when they went to the temple, that was the language spoken by priests and the Levites. The implication in all of this is that the foreign cultures of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab were watering down the religion of the Jewish people. Nehemiah was concerned about parents faithfully passing on their faith to their next generation. We had a case in point here um, to the Israelites in the Northern Kingdom, uh, which later we come to know as the Samaritans. They were captured by the cruel Assyrians and forced to intermarry with other captured neighboring nations. This was the Assyrian way to annihilate the whole nation. They completely, the Israelites completely lost their ethnic distinctive. They lost their identity, they lost their language, and they lost their faith. How do we respond to such persistent sin of compromise? Well, Nehemiah confronted them, cursed them, and beat up some of them, and even pulled out their hair. Now, we know that this is hilarious, you know, but do you know that Nehemiah is quite smart here? He is pulling the hair of the other people. But Ezra, if you read the book of Ezra, Ezra pulled out his own hair okay, instead. I'm not sure how literal we should take this, but one thing we do know is that in extreme situations or in drastic times, we need to call for extreme measure to deal with it. Extreme situation calls for extreme measure. In our case today, we must take heed of Nehemiah's warning and stop compromising 
on what we know right in our worship of God and in our personal and family life. Next, we must stop tolerating what we know to be wrong. The downfall of spiritual life not only began with compromising on what we know right, but also being hastened by tolerating what we know to be wrong. Let us continue with the reading of the passage from verses 15 to 22. In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs and all kinds of loads which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also who live in the city brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, Why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. When God entered a covenant with his people, he gave visible sign to demonstrate his love for them and commitment to them. Supremely, he gave them the book of the law. He gave them a place which is the temple in Nehemiah's time. He gave them a ministry which is served by priests and the Levites. And he gave them the Sabbath day at the end of each week, which they were to devote exclusively to him. On his return, Nehemiah found that not only in the holy city, but also in Judah's surrounding communities, there was no attempt to keep the Sabbath day special. The seventh day was much like any other day. This outward sign of the commitment to God was no longer evident to an unbelieving neighbor. By their disobedience to God's word, they had come to worship the unseen idols of contemporary culture, the invisible gods of humanism, secularism, materialism, and pluralism had taken the place of the only true God. Gentile visitors to Jerusalem were no longer able to witness as formerly, previously, the devotion, the integrity, and the loyalty expressed in the weekly act of worship and rest. And that is our worship on the Sabbath day. The reason that the Sabbath had been instituted was to recall both creation and redemption. God's people were to rest as God had rested and enjoy doing what God had commanded. In slavery in Egypt, the ancestor had longed for rest. So in the covenant, 
all labor was expressly forbidden on this special day, the Sabbath day. Yet, indifferent to God's word, men and women in Judah's fields were now harvesting, doing the very thing the law had expressly forbidden for that day. Throughout Judah, they were harvesting their grapes, loading their grain, working their donkeys, carrying their produce, that is their wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads, and selling their wares, all on the Sabbath day, which God had told them to keep as his own special day. Nehemiah recognized that quick action was that the quick action was urgently needed. Something must be done about the nation's sin. So he responded with the following. First, he confronted the leaders and calling the violation of the Sabbath law an evil. Next, he enforced the practice of no business on the Sabbath day. He commanded that the gates be shut and he posted servants. He posted guards at the gates to make sure that they stay shut until the end of the Sabbath day. He warned those who tried to violate his command and threatened punishment if they tried it again. He commanded the Levites to cleanse themselves because they had allowed the Sabbath to be violated. This story, the story today, reveals clearly the way evil works. It invades us quietly. Before we are aware of it, we have compromised ourselves and gone along with the standards widely accepted by the world around us. We find the people of God have often been corrupted and polluted by this kind of thing. There are many instances of it today when it comes down to individual. This is a picture of our struggle with our sinful nature. What this story depicts is the times when we must take a strong stand against evil in ourselves. We must be prepared to be drastic and take painful action to clear up the things that are wrong in our own affairs. Let all of us be careful. Stop the sin before the sin stops us. In order not to allow our spiritual life to slowly slip away, we must stop compromising on what we know right. And we must stop tolerating what we know to be wrong. May God help us. Let us uh, spend a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts for our Holy Communion today. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, let us remember what Jesus had done on the cross for us and for the people of the world. And remember his last command for us to make disciples of all nations. Let us go to God now and ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts for any unconfessed sin. And when the Spirit surfaces it to us, confess it before God. Merciful Lord, we do not presume to come to your table 
trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your abundant mercies. We are not worthy before you, for we have sinned. So with humble, lowly, and penitent hearts, we come to seek your face and favour. Let your mercy be upon us, O Lord, we pray. Amen. Now in his name, I take the common elements that we have set apart for the sacred use of our Holy Communion today. According to the Holy Institution, the example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in remembrance of him, we celebrate this communion. Jesus, the same light on which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The Lord's table is open to all Christians who truly and earnestly repent from their sins and desire his help to live a holy life. Now, will all those who are partaking in the bread and the cup, will you now please stand? Taking the bread now. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Take, eat, this we do in remembrance of him. Taking the cup now. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ which he shed for many for the forgiveness of our sins. Take, drink out of it in remembrance of him. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Be seated, please. Now we invite the worship team to close us with the response song. Bear with me as I put my hearing aids back in. <clears throat> they don't always work that well with masks. Thank you. Please stand as we close. <clears throat> Yes. 
compose so rich a crown. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, the standing as we receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated please. After a moment of silent prayer and meditation, you may be dismissed. Go forth and serve the Lord.